did I catch you off guard? I was off guard. I'm off guard. Off guard. Kim's <laughs> off guard. Uh, welcome, everyone, to Ginger Runner Live, episode number 249. We are getting up there, and we're almost <laughs> out of the 240. I can't believe that. We're almost at 250 something. Uh, Kim and I are fresh off of a, a weekend of incredible trails, incredible people at the uh, Hillbillies Trail Camp here in Washington State on Orcas Island, which is one of the most incredible places on Earth. I highly encourage you guys to check it out, but we'll talk about that maybe a little bit on tonight's episode. Uh, but we want to get right into it. We're starting a bit earlier tonight because our guest has another run to do tonight, which is like, you just raced. No <laughs> breaks. Uh, Claire Gallagher is joining us on the show tonight. We're going to talk all about Way Too Cool 50K and her crushing of what sounded like a sloppy event. <laughs> it looked a little wet. Look a little wet. Some <laughs> rainstorms, some crazy amounts of mud and puddles and rivers and everything. Uh, it sounded like all the runners had quite the experience with the elements out there. So Claire will be joining us on tonight's episode. I am very excited. Welcome everyone to Ginger Runner Live, episode number 249. The show begins now. Ginger Runner. Yay! <laughs> what is up, everybody? Welcome to Ginger Runner Live, episode number 249. We appreciate you taking some time out of your busy Mondays to spend a little bit of it with us. Uh, we're starting a little bit earlier tonight. Our guest is on a bit of a timetable, so we just want to like dive right into it and pick her brain. She um, is an incredible ultra runner, has some big wins under her belt. If you look at her ultra running resume, you'll mm -hmm. just the job will drop, of course. Uh, <laughs> most recently was the Way Too Cool 50K in Cool California, uh, just crushing it, winning it outright on what sounded like a very wet, rainy, sloppy, muddy, crazy weather day. Uh, so she just dominated, and it's really great to have her on the show. She's a guest. Uh, Claire Gallagher is our guest tonight. Uh, she's a guest that both Kim and I have talked about, like, just kind of in our everyday life, at least once a week. We talk about week. Claire every day. Like, every day. There's some moment where we're like, man... <laughs> What would Claire do right now? Um, but she's come up in conversation so many times. And every every time Kim and I like, we just got to bring her on the show and talk to her. Tonight is a perfect excuse because she just crushed a race. She's been this incredible activist for public uh, spaces, outdoor space. Uh, she's just got this incredible voice. Um, and I'm excited to kind of pick her brain and find out what's been on her plate the last six months, year, and why she's like back at it, ready to race, <laughs> what her goals are for 2019. So we'll... I uh, introduce Claire here in just a second. I am not the only person here behind the mic. You're not? No. Oh. You are here. <laughs> uh, yeah. Hi, guys. It's Kim here. And <laughs> what do you, were you just? Vanna Whiting. You doing? It was Vanna Whiting. The podcast folks can't, can't see that. No, you're right. For those who were listening, I was, I was Vanna Whiting. Um, yes. As always, you guys, I am here. I am manning the, uh, I almost said aid station. That's, that's what that's what this should be called. It should be called that. Uh, the chat room. Just a reminder, you guys, we are live. We have Claire here with us. If you guys have questions for Claire, pop them into the chat room. We'll be pulling them throughout the night. Yes, Kim and I are fresh off of an incredible weekend on Orcas Island, uh, which is the location every year. This is now my third year, your second mm -hmm. year, participating in the Hillbillies Trail Camp, which is put on by Brian Morrison, uh, who you might remember from a decade on the movie that I made a while back, having almost won Western States in 2006 and going back in 2016. Incredible runner, owner of Fleet Feet Seattle. Uh, they put on a trail camp on this beautiful island just off of the Washington coast in the San Juans. Uh, and it is just a beautiful place to run. It was super cold and snowy, but beautiful sun, crisp mornings and uh, got tons of miles with incredible people. And yes. we'll talk a little bit more about that uh, later in tonight's show. But I am wearing, I do want to give a shout out to John. Uh, who created these amazing buttons uh, at Trail Camp. You won't be able to see it, but it base, it's a fun meter. Fun meter, <laughs> and right now it's off the charts because our <laughs> guest picks that much ass. Uh, before we introduce Claire Gallagher, our Patreon supporters are the reason that we are able to do this live show. Uh, reviews, films, everything that happens here is because of them. So big shout out and thank you to all of our Patreon supporters, three in particular. Chris Lee in Hong Kong, showcasing all the amazing trails in Hong Kong. Uh, Rick Bjarnason from British Columbia, who redid the gingerrunner.com website. Incredible human who is an ultra runner and has a great team of really talented web designers at his uh, disposal at cheekymonkeymedia.ca. Mm -hmm. And Brian Sands, longtime supporter. Incredible story. Has lost over 100 pounds on his journey through marathon, ultra marathon, now training for his first 50 miler. Just 
just amazing dude and was also the sponsor of one of the runners uh, at this weekend's trail camp uh so he was gracious enough to provide a spot for someone to go and run in his stead at this camp which is yes. just a really generous amazing amazing thing so big shout out to those three individuals without further ado coming to us from <laughs> i'm guessing colorado but we never know with claire she could be somewhere <laughs> across the globe she could be in space i don't know claire gallagher <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for having me. I have been reading a lot about space recently, so it's funny you mention it. I won't put it. I wouldn't put it past Claire. Like, hey, Claire, where are you coming to us from? Uh, I made a quick stop space. at the International Space Station. Are you back home? In Actually, oh my gosh, you guys, did you see? This is. I'm sorry, but did you see the last words of the Mars rover? Yes. I didn't. Oh my God, it will make you cry. It this was... is what I was doing after Way Too Cool on Saturday night. I kid you not. I'm sitting with my friend, Abby Levine. She got ninth. And sorry, I just completely hijacked uh, your show. <laughs> this is why we want you on the show. You are joy. <laughs> And and I start crying and I was just like, oh no, I'm thinking about the Mars rover again. Because it said, it said, it's getting dark and my battery's running low. Yeah. Oh, and it's the no. what... saddest. <laughs> so sad. Yeah, I, I'm so glad you know it, Kim. Yeah, everyone should Google this. It will make you cry. And then the NASA scientists played back Billy Holiday's I'll Be Seeing You. <laughs> there was an episode of, have you, there's a Netflix series called Seven Days. And it follows like the last seven days or the the first seven days of something. They did like a, a, a dog show and the seven days leading up to a dog show. But the one that actually <laughs> got to me the most were the last seven days, I believe, was a Galileo. It was the one that they uh, basically crashed into Saturn. Or was it oh uh, like I'm already God. off to a great start here? <laughs> Regardless, yeah. it was the last seven days of this satellite um, uh, of its exploration. And you could, I mean, just you touch base with all the scientists who have basically been there for 25 years with this thing. I want to say raising it from a baby. Yeah. But they built it oh by God. hand and sent it up and have just been studying for years. And they all had to say goodbye. It was kind of this it was big a thing. heartbreaking. It was heartbreaking space story. Yeah. So I'm relating, but not with the Mars rover, because now I have to go yeah. see with the last telecast to Mars rover. So are you in space? <laughs> <laughs> Back to the original. I'm semi in space, okay. but no, I'm in Boulder, Colorado. My okay. home. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so I'm assuming you... you how is travel for you as far as when you go to travel for races and stuff like that? Do you always do it? Do you try to give yourself like a buffer on either end or is it just no, put me on a plane? No, it's, let me it's, sleep? Yeah, it's completely random and whatever, you know, the schedule works out and I can sleep anywhere. It's actually a, I find one of my greatest strengths. <laughs> <laughs> so um yeah it's yeah it's fine I actually moved this past week into um a, a close friend of mine bought a condo and so I was I was honestly like not really in the zone going into way too cool wow. I was like a little all over the place um but you know say la vie that's how it goes <laughs> I feel like that's probably a bit of a benefit like you go into a race almost well I was moving all week I you know, maybe my week, I didn't get enough sleep or that sort of thing. I'm kind of tired going into it. Mm -hmm. Maybe it was a blessing in disguise. Maybe you're like, yeah, let's just have some fun. It's raining. It's muddy. Why not? Yeah, totally. And I was like, wow, it's such a gift to be able to run 30 miles like in California. This is really fun. And it's been really cold in Colorado mm. and Boulder, especially. And I'm soft. It hasn't been like, you know, Casey looked tight cold in <laughs> Omaha or like Tim Tolson, <laughs> you know. Um, but but I was like, oh, it's going to be California. It was like 50 degrees and raining. It was amazing. Um, so I was I was I was psyched. Yeah. Just to be like get the opportunity to race. <laughs> I love the the conversation that you and Casey and Tim have been having as far as like just, <laughs> just so awesome to get outside. Now, on it's Twitter. great. It's so yeah, funny. on Twitter. And now Casey's like, oh, it's negative 10 degrees outside. But Tim would do it. Yeah. Claire would do it. I have no excuse. And like, she's getting And outside. then Tim's like, Casey, don't hurt yourself. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like, like, it's okay to say yes to the treadmill. <laughs> it is okay. Permission yeah. granted. Um, so let's, let's back up a little bit. So your 2018 <laughs> was... Uh, was pretty amazing uh, because we've been following you for so long. We've, we've known you for a while seeing the, uh, I hope it's okay to talk a little bit about the sp the sponsor transition. Cause I thought that was a really neat <laughs> thing. You have been such 
uh, an active voice in the uh, in in the community uh, for public lands. I mean, you're you've been so pro public lands and, and trying to save Colorado lands and basically doing a lot for the environment for for Earth. And your voice has been so clear. And uh, was the move to Patagonia that sort of you wanted to be able to do that more? Um, uh, on a regular basis or what was the choice? What was the reasoning behind the move? And, and tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, honestly, I, I, it was an opportunity. Um, I, I, Patagonia is the type of company where it's like you, I, I had dreamed of being sponsored by Patagonia when I first like went pro, um, after Leadville in 2016. And, right. but it's, it's not the, like you don't go to them. <laughs> like they rarely add ambassadors. And um, so when I had the opportunity uh, to to join, it was it was an absolute no brainer. Um, it's completely changed and like enhanced like why I care about like living and the and the world. And um, it's it's such a radical radical company. Um, in a way that's really pragmatic, actually. It's like, oh, Yvonne Chouinard, uh, you know, just wants to make sure that Earth still exists as we somewhat know it, you know, 500 years from now. Um, it's not rocket science, and it's amazing because they actually, you know, are still a profitable business with with this model. Um, <clears throat> so, yeah, it's it's been incredible. I'm technically a global sports activist for mm. Patagonia, so, um, so I, I – Patagonia doesn't really – they care about racing, but not, not, they actually don't like, <laughs> not like, um, pretty much any other sponsor we see in the trail running world. Uh, Patagonia cares about saving the planet. And, and the reality is trail runners, we have such opportunities to do that and to be voices like we, you, you and I, uh, the two, you know, two of you, everyone listening, Everyone who goes outside is witness to climate change every day and over, the, especially over the course of years. And so I feel like it's, it's a really awesome opportunity to actually take part in hopefully the right side of history mm -hmm. <laughs> um, by just talking about it, you know, and you don't, who I don't care what you're wearing. I don't give a shit what jacket you're wearing. Like, <laughs> like <laughs> climate change is like way bigger than this, you know, <laughs> So um, it's been very empowering in that regard. I mean, yeah. I kind of want to, I, I kind of want to dig into this a little bit deeper because just hearing that Patagonia wants you to be a, a essentially an activist. In addition, like of course you're an athlete, and of course you'll go get results if you want to and stuff like that. But just to be a sponsored activist is kind of a cool role. Is it something that you? I guess when they presented it to you, was it something uh, that you wanted to take on full force or was it kind of experimenting for you? Um, was it something that you were like, oh, hell yeah, this is exactly what I want to do? What was kind of that initial reaction to the offer and the partnership? Yeah, so I first was brought on as a trail running ambassador, which is um, somewhat uh, standard as, you know, a, a sports ambassador. Okay. And then in, it was like three months ago that, um, I was brought on as the first global sports activist trail runner. And Patagonia has currently four surfers who, who have this role and they're looking to expand it over time. Um, just because sport and activism can, and I think should be synonymous in a lot of ways. Um, and so, yeah, I'm, fortunate and have you know the opportunity to see how we can make trail runners more a little more engaged um and on the whole like we have the best community i think out of any sport so <laughs> so there's there's so much momentum you know there's millions of us um and yeah so that's been the transition it wasn't immediately like i was a an you know, brought on as an activist, but Patagonia doesn't bring on ambassadors who don't have some sort of like ethos or lifestyle that, that matches, um, you know, they take that very seriously. Mm -hmm. Uh, whether it's like, even if you're just obsessed with your sport, like a lot of those ambassadors live like really minimalist lifestyles, um, and, and conscientious lifestyles. So, so it's pretty cool. It's like really inspiring because everyone around you, you're like, ah, <laughs> give me some of your <laughs> that energy yeah. yeah 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 how can how can we as you know uh, regular users of outdoor spaces whether it's just i mean we have viewers who use trails and roads at this point parks mountains whatever how can we as regular users of this 
be a more vocal part of it or be a, uh, be a part of change, like be a part of helping these spaces exist and continue to exist for our children yeah. and their children's children. Totally. Funny you ask. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the, the biggest thing is to continue loving your sport and your, your passion, which is for us here, trail running and to continue to do it because, um, you know, it's an Edward Abbey quote, like being a part-time activist is important. Like you have to be in these spaces to develop that reverence and deep passion for outdoor spaces and something as simple as like breathing clean air. And so that's where like the second step, you know, okay, enjoy your time, have amazing times with your friends and like go crazy on the trails. But the second step is actually giving back and realizing that none of this comes free. Like there's, we have these public trails because really smart people in the last 200 years have protected them. And we need to continue that right now in the current legislative legislative system and that goes with climate um so supporting you know climate change measures and you guys wait you guys are in oregon right washington no oh yeah you're, you're in seattle yeah okay sorry yeah. We well tax. oregon yeah yeah <laughs> oregon is gonna possibly pass a carbon tax it might be the first state this year so you know tuning into those issues and then also of course the protection of public lands and and any protection of public lands is a ch climate change issue it's because when lands are protected like say a wilderness status. This day and age, a lot of wilderness statuses are developed because the federal government is buying back mining or oil and gas leases from companies and ensuring that they're not extracting on those lands. So so we see these wilderness and we think public lands and it's like we need to think that extra step of like, oh, this is actually helping climate change like when you see a forest intact it's like okay this is good this is good for like hopefully you know it's here a hundred years from now and it and it should be if it's protected um and so yeah just talking about it like with your friends on the trail and with your family at vacations and holidays like because at the end of the day the people in charge are voted into office and, you know, the president appoints the head of the EPA, the president appoints the head of the Sec uh, Department of Interior, you know, it goes on and on and on. And, and like, I feel so strongly about our role as citizens in democracy as trail runners. <laughs> yeah, it's been, it's been interesting to kind of consider ourselves like ambassadors in a sense to just the trails and the mm -hmm. environments in our backyard, right? Like, yeah. we, we can we can talk in, in, in big platitudes and say, like, just make a difference, you know, that sort of thing that that's not what you're saying. I'm saying like that's the kind of stuff that we get oftentimes is just just do what you got to do to make the place a better place. And the reality <laughs> is that's not specific. That's nothing. Uh, but right. there's like great comments here in the chat room from like Wing, for example, yeah. kind of dovetailing with what you're saying. I got a drink after that. Um, uh, go ahead. Yeah. Wing said, uh, like, do something as simple as find local organizations who work on maintain and support the trails that you're using. Right. Yeah. Uh, and so I think amazing gas yes, wing <laughs> easy, easy to do for those listening, watching, you know, we obviously take advantage of some of these incredible spaces, getting out and doing more to get back to that or spreading the word and getting people to join you on these places. And, and so they can experience that reverence, I think is amazing. I, I'm just also uh, really curious with this new sort of activism and uh, a, a lot of time. I know you spent a lot of time doing this last year. Were you able to get any adventures in? at all for yourself last year and be able to get out and, and get to see some cool places? Yeah, for sure. Last year, I actually didn't have my best year of racing and I almost over raced, I think. Mm. And, and this had nothing to do with my activism or work with Patagonia. Um, it, I, I was chasing points for UTMB, um, <laughs> through August essentially. And, and I, and I raced a lot and I raced in Europe a handful of times, which I've committed to not doing again mm. in one calendar year. Um, like a lot I was, cause I went to worlds in Spain in May and then I was in Lavaredo in June and then UTMB and, um, in August and I was in Italy in March. So, you know, and I was like, really not, I'm not psyched on that, uh, carbon footprint one. And I didn't end up having the best races <laughs> cause I was over, over raced. Um, so that being said, they were amazing experiences on the whole. Uh, 
And my favorite adventure of last year was, was actually a consequence of climate change, uh, loosely, but still it counts, you know, the North Face race being canceled um, in San Francisco because of the campfire and the campfire is considered a mega fire. It's really, really large. It's over a thousand acres. And those have been directly correlated to really, really dry forests that are just like ready to burn. And when you have any sort of ignition uh, instance, you know, these mega fires occur. So anyways, and we all know that air quality is really bad in San Francisco. Uh, so I went to Utah instead and ran ac across Zion National Park. Um, and I'd never been there before. And it was a complete adventure because God bless Hayden Hawks. Oh my God. I'm seriously <laughs> so obsessed with him. He's the nicest. And his wife, Ashley, is just the sweetest. Um, he basically, he didn't hold my hand through the FKT, but like <laughs> he ran with me for 20 miles. He drove me and my three Boulder friends who we call ourselves the inept Boulder crew because my car. Um, Did it break down? Yeah, I completely blew my engine on the way there. Like <laughs> this like. Oh wait, Prius I just bought, like <laughs> still had temporary plates on it. And it was awful. Essentially, you stole the car, it was didn't you, Claire? Was it a stolen yeah. car? <laughs> <laughs> um, so the engine blew, and then it, you know, I left it in like Hayden's front yard for a month and just paid someone in Cedar City to put in a new engine. It was a total shit show. But I got the FKT out of the whole situation. Yeah. <laughs> it was that's, a very expensive FKT, but that's but, the story um, I wanted to, like I was like, I want to talk about the FKT. What adventures? <laughs> yeah. Like I didn't yeah. know that you like basically slept in a front lawn for like a month in like preparation and around. Yeah. It. Now we go. drove a rental car back and then I and then I like took a red eye to Vegas and a Greyhound to Cedar city it was fun um the details of that aren't exactly important but the point being like going on an adventure that's spontaneous because i had all these plans for tnf right which is so you know dialed and there's yeah. really nothing the that's prep for you know you, you yeah yeah 50 miles win but it, then but then it's like okay within 48 hours all these new logistics come up and it's just so fun like i'm just like geeking out on zion history and utah history and like you know i had these friends who jumped in at the last minute so i i encourage people if their races get canceled to take advantage of having friends and time on your hands and and that's what like jonathan um Levitt did in Truckee, raising a bunch of money you right. know for campfire victims uh like it's beautiful. It just shows the 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 beauty of of you know trail runners' desire to do stupid runs. <laughs> we had him on actually after he did that, and it was just it was because I, oh I loved God, it. It was right, just such a refreshing right. idea. I was like, yeah. yeah, you know, all you're not the only athlete to have been affected by the <clears> by the fires and the cancellation of that race. Or like every guest I think we've had on the show since then has had. You know, like they were going to come race it, or they were going to come spectator crew, or something, and it, it totally affected by that, and it kind of changed everyone's goals for December and January. Um, for you, wait right, too, this whole year whole essentially. Year. Uh, Look at Lake Sonoma Starless. Pretty coincidence. Nuts. I yeah. Think that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, actually, before I even start digging into uh, to way too cool uh, questions from the live chat room, Kim, you pulled a bunch of okay. stuff. Uh, yeah, there's a question from Nathaniel. Nathaniel says, you speak about the negative impacts of over racing. You raced way too cool this month and are set for Lake Sonoma, Scout Mountain, Western States through June. How do you prepare for this type of workload? Mm, that's a great question. Thanks for asking. Um, I think it's reasonable. And I, I signed up for Scout Mountain. That's very sweet of him to notice. Um, <laughs> <laughs> mainly, um, I do really well with like an effort three to four, two to three weeks before my biggest effort. And, and my biggest effort, no surprise, is going to be Western States this year, you know, knock on wood, assuming I stay healthy. And so um, I really want to go support my buddy, Luke Nelson, another Patagonia Trail ambassador in Idaho. Um, he does a lot of really good low impact tactics for Scout Mountain. And I've just heard amazing things about it. So everyone should look that up. It's outside Pocatello. <laughs> um, so I almost see that as like work in a way, you know, I, I need to see what the best races are doing to have a low impact and, and that's Scout Mountain. And then, um, 
Lake Sonoma is when I'm going to actually like start to put my head in the game for states. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Cause I kind of need like ignition to get going and like serious about training. Like I'm always relatively like baseline. I care about training and stuff, but um, sometimes, yeah, like I can, I can g- get a little loose you know, so I need, I need like Sonoma in there because yeah. between now and States, like it's just, there is a lot of time. So that's my rationale. I mean, it makes sense. And like Sonoma, let's be honest, this year is going to be super fun to follow. Yeah. Uh, as you mentioned, <laughs> lots of people, uh, m- more live questions. Go ahead. Yeah. Great question from Caroline in the chat room. Caroline says, how do you feel about trail races that take place in super muddy conditions? I ran a 50 K this weekend and felt guilty trashing the trails after I saw the damage done by runners ahead of me. I wonder if she ran way too cool <laughs> because <laughs> the whole time I was talking about it with this dude, Dave from Orange County. I'm like, Dave, what are your thoughts on this? This is during way too cool. Um, you know, because the, the, I think the verb is like braided, like, you know, trails get braided where everyone runs us away from the center line, which right. is the muddiest mm-hmm. and expands the trails. And I actually was talking to someone on Twitter about this. Cause he asked, do you think the race should have been canceled? And, and I'm my uneducated guess. Cause I actually didn't like ask the race director or anything at way too cool is that these trails can handle this much foot traffic in these conditions just because it's held year after year and formidable, you know, was there two weeks ago, right. roughly on the same trails. Um, and so that's what I'm guessing. Like the, the ground is, is very unique in that part of the country. Like in Colorado, it rains like a centimeter the trails are closed just because we don't have the same at least in boulder ability the vegetation can't hold that much water it just runs off and erodes and so my understanding from at least in cool california is that it's actually a really really absorbing ground and there's so much vegetation that these trails will recover um but i commend caroline for asking that question Cause I think it's, this is like exactly what we should be asking. Like, are we right. doing more harm, you know? Um, and obviously like avoiding not ever running on cl- trails that are closed due to mud conditions. That's should go without saying. Yeah. Yeah. Caroline says that she ran the Greenway Seneca Creek 50 K in Maryland. So it sounds like oh, a lot cool. of places had nice. <laughs> some, some, some dicey weather. And I remember my yeah. first 50 K in San Francisco was on trails that were, I, you know, there was a storm that rolled through and it was the, some of the muddiest conditions I have ever experienced. Mm-hmm. And those were the Marin headlands. And my thought was, this is destroying these trails because uh, like every footstep was six to eight inches deep. And what they oh ended up canceling the second day of races because oh, okay. the damage the first day was significant. And they were like, these trails need to heal, which is what happened. Uh, the trails did right. heal. But yeah, it's, infra- it's that's a great question, mm-hmm. Caroline, because I'm always really curious mm-hmm. about that, too. Uh, I think a really, a really good question. And and I it. just, I, yeah. And it's like, I just assume that the people in charge and the permits that are allowing these races to happen are being responsible about when to cancel and when not to. Right. And it's often the rogue trail users that aren't part of a sanctioned event, at least at, in Colorado, that are actually doing damage who are, you know, ducking gates and whatnot. That's what right. I see when I follow the Boulder open space um, trail reports. They're like, what the heck? Like people, the trails are closed. Like stop, yeah. like you are breaking the trails. And so I'm just assuming that, you know, the powers that be in cool and in Seneca, Maryland, um, you know, looked at the environment and said, okay, the trails will recover from this, even though it's insane. I mean, yeah, even though the conditions <laughs> yeah. are like bonkers and we'll show a video that Jonathan Levitt actually took of you crossing uh, a Creek, uh, which is much less of a Creek and more of an ocean. <laughs> Uh, but just having talked with parks departments and stuff like that, with the event that we're planning, Mm -hmm. they wouldn't allow an event to take place uh, if the conditions were thought to get to the point of, um, destruction, damage damage Mm -hmm. and, and Mm -hmm. irreparable damage. Like we know for a fact that at least the the companies that we're working or the organizations we're working with would full on say, either limit the field size, limit the starting number in a timed way, uh, or no event whatsoever. Uh, so if Caroline, that sounds like your event went on as planned. I'm assuming that race director was 100% uh, communicating with those parks departments. There's no doubt about that. Yeah. Um, let's start getting into way too cool. Uh, I 
have never run this race. I've run the trails. I'm very familiar with it. I know that it is a very fast 50K. Was that the case this year? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, no. Well, actually, so it's confusing because, well, it's maybe it's not confusing. I don't know what to say. Um, the, if we want to look at winning times from last year in both genders. Okay. So I was almost 10 minutes slower than Ladia from last year, um, which isn't insignificant. And I'm pretty sure Anthony Costellis was the, a minute faster than Max King. Max King maybe was I'm making that up. Anthony oh, was, he was 317. Oh, 17. Oh, never mind. Okay. Oh, yes. Okay. That actually makes me feel a lot better. But, but, but Max King in uh, last year, Max King was 318. So, yeah, he was yeah, a little faster. Minute faster. Right. Yeah, but yeah. Max King, I guess, okay. that was in 2013, so, a long time ago. So, it is interesting. Like, it, uh, I don't know, it begs mm -hmm. the question of, like, did the, was Anthony and the rest of the men's field, like, you know, that much faster or are men better at running in these, um, horrible conditions. I don't, I'm not sure. Um, but it wasn't fast from we need my, to decide this it, tonight. It, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Right. It's just, it's worth it to point out stats. Right. For sure. But, um, I, I thought it was so fast. Like in the first eight miles, I honestly felt good. But then I look at my watch and I was like, holy shit, we are running so fast. There is absolutely no way I can sustain this pace but I did know that in order to podium or win that that you know a seven and change minute mile had to be my average and um yeah it felt fast but I also really like running fast I know that I've like had success in the longer races but um I don't have that high of mileage and training and I and I do pretty fast speed workouts uh via my amazing coach David Roach and um so I was honestly excited to like really crank on the like fast meter. And like, I went all out the last 10 miles. I haven't felt like that in a race in a really long time. Where I was like, all right, this is the last 10 miles of your life. Like, let's go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Let's see what you could do. Um, yeah. So it definitely, it felt fast. <laughs> that's, that's, I mean, it obvious. like I, I saw, I'm going to show you the video. So this is a video uh, provided to us by Jonathan Levitt, who we've had on the show before. Awesome, awesome dude. And was out there supporting, crewing, pacing. Uh, no, supporting, <laughs> cheering, videoing. Uh, I don't think he yeah. was pacing because yeah. I don't think that's allowed there. But this video is of Claire crossing something. We'll get some context here in a second. Uh, Claire, you won't be able to see the video, but uh, everyone oh. should be able to hear it other than Claire. Okay, here we go. You're right on her tail. You're right on her tail. Nice job. <laughs> go get it go get it so is that normally just a tiny creek um this is the one he he He's, posted coming, right yeah, okay yeah, you're coming okay. towards him up the hill uh no i think that's like an actual river okay yeah but and and honestly that one was like no problem at all and so i don't know if you can hear what i'm saying but i i honestly I, went i want to know pretty slowly through that one because less than five minutes prior i had misjudged another stream crossing and it was in the dense forest it was amazing it was right at mile 17 i looked at my watch because i was like holy sh like and um I misjudged where to enter the stream mm -hmm. and I just sent it where there weren't rocks. And I kid you not, my full pack was underwater and my hands were up and I was screaming at this dude who honestly was really nice. But I was like, ah, like, what? Because he saw the right flags and I was like, why didn't you tell me? <laughs> like, I'm like I'm in the river and I and I get out and I, I was literally fording the river and then I and then I cross where it was more like just up to my knees and and I just couldn't I was freaking out I was like I could have like been submerged <laughs> I could have been swimming you know, downstream for a day and I was so wet like I know everyone was so wet but like I mean my my shirt was soaking wet. My hood was full of water. Like it was it was hilarious. And then when I saw Jonathan, I just had to tell someone. And um and at that point, I was like, oh, Addie's a while ahead. I've kind of settled in. And he said, you know, she's not that far. And I was like, oh, eh, 
I just ate like six gels in the last hour because I was bonking. Maybe I'll feel better. <laughs> and lo and behold, like I bonked so hard in mile 14. I thought I was going to die. And I was like, my race is over. Like I should just stop now. So everyone goes through those emotions, right? Uh-huh. <laughs> and so I shove, you know, f- I think it was four gels in an hour, which is a lot in a 50K. Yeah. And and those calories propelled my <laughs> final 10 miles. Um, yeah, I came back from the dead, like totally pretty much right after that crossing and, and Jonathan's energy and a few more friends as energy really, um, really helped. So yeah, we normally have guests on the show that are, this is why I love Claire is because (laughs) I remember the last time you were on the show, it was after Leadville, we were talking a bit about just kind of your preparation and your execution during the race. And it was very much the same. It seems like a lot hasn't changed in that. (laughs) You just kind of do what you want in the time. It's not like you go into it going, I need to do, maybe you do go into it. Like I need to do exactly a gel every 30 minutes. I need to stick to this plan. It seems like you just kind of like, listen, I'm not hungry. I'm not going to eat. And then at mile 14, you bonk. You're like, ah, shit, I need to take gels. And you take four. You're like, I'm cured. And like, go crush it and win. <laughs> Were you, did you have a strategy going into way, way too cool? Like you have goals this year. So did you go into yeah, it with like a... Yeah, for sure. Dialing it in? I mean, I usually go in with an idea that I'm going to have a gel like at least every half hour. Okay. Um, but I, I waited a little bit cause I'm experimenting with not eating gels in the first hour. Cause I've actually like over fueled myself <laughs> in the past. Um, that's what and I do. Then, that's what I do. It, uh, <laughs> Smart mind. I wait an hour. Thing, right? yeah, yeah. Okay. And, and then, yeah, I mean the bonk I think was just natural and, and my legs were feeling, you know, 14 miles of actually really fast, hard running with so much stabilizing. And I was sending these stream crossings, which like takes mental energy. You know, right. I was not tiptoeing around the water because I was like, this trail race is going to be won by like being an aggressive trail runner. And I actually really like that, uh, when I'm in the zone and I totally was in the zone on that. Um, so it was like, oh shoot, I'm expending a lot of energy. And that's where it's just like, well, I'm either gonna feel like crap the rest of the race, or if I eat more, I might recover. <laughs> right. <laughs> which is which is, you know, that's I think something that everyone goes through. And 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 luckily I wasn't nauseous, you know, so like I could eat them. And yeah, there's a reason why people say like you should eat when you're bonking. <laughs> <laughs> Those crazy people and their logic and yeah. based evidence wow. and, and all that stuff. Uh, we do have some live questions. Of course, uh, we have a lot of people tuning in now to our regularly scheduled time yes. start time. Uh, we did start a little bit earlier tonight with Claire. You're welcome to go back and watch the full episode uh, or just hang out and ask some questions. Uh, so if you do have a question for Claire, drop it into the chat room. Kim will pull it. What do we got? Yeah, a question from Nathaniel. Nathaniel asks, what was the most challenging element of the race? And what, was there a point in which you knew you were going to win? Mm. Thanks for those questions. The most challenging was definitely when I was feeling my lowest, which was, it was really like mile 15. I had been in the lead after a pretty long downhill and was feeling great. And then Addie passed me with the group of guys we had been running with who were so fun. Dave from Orange County. We call them Papa D. Poppy. (laughs) (laughs) Shout out to Dave from Orange County. Yeah, yeah, (laughs) we're having so much fun. And I was really sad because I couldn't keep up with them. I was like, no, like, (laughs) like, come back. Um, and, And that's when I was, you know, like alone eating honey stingers by myself. (laughs) <laughs> just, I just picture um, like the saddest Claire just sitting in the mud, just like, yeah. no, I'm not sad. Yeah. sad like basically. Music. Um, and then, and then I saw Addie in a switchback. It was, I think mile 23. So there was about seven miles to go. Cause it's a little bit shorter than a 50 K this way too cool. And, and I thought I can catch her. And when I did catch her with five miles to go, I could tell I was ready to fight for the win. And there was even a point. So we stayed together for a couple miles and went up the infamous little goat hill. It's not little. It, it is little, but it's very steep. This really steep hill together. And and there's this hilarious guy, these classic cool uh, trail running fans with a megaphone. He was like, yes, like you are Miss America. Like you guys are going to finish megaphone finish hand in hand and I kind of looked at Addie and I was like and 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 she was just like 
straight focus to her credit because it's like yeah we're both way too competitive i think to to go <laughs> to there. It. but i was like yeah <laughs> <laughs> there's no Plus. slarbin there's no slarbin yeah. that way too cool <laughs> um but yeah and then and then um I don't know I took some coke at an aid station Addie kept going and then when I caught up to her again I was like well it's now or never I'm gonna send this downhill and I sent it and uh and didn't look back so yeah that was with three miles to go so it was a very long three miles actually it was a long 20 minutes (laughs) it's I what I love is like you and Addie were essentially racing together for a lot of it. Uh, I, I know when you caught her, it sounds like you were actually together for a few miles and it seems like you're very supportive yeah, of one another. Chatting. And, yeah, mm-hmm. chatting and like enjoying it. And, you know, yeah. just having talked to you before and knowing you, I feel like that's pretty common for you as well as to enjoy the company of the other badasses that you're around. And like, whether it's Dave from Orange County, shout out to Dave, <laughs> uh, or Audi, or Addie. He defined his last name. Yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll figure it out. I'm going to I'm gonna look at like finish times. And if anyone yeah. knows who yeah. Dave from Orange County is, let's, let's yeah. make sure we give him a shout. Uh, he says he's part of the Pop Tart Trail Club or something. Did he finish around you at all? Behind me. Oh, that, yeah. that, that's David from Boise. Have- that one. Oh no, that's not orange can. No, no, we'll, we'll we'll figure it out. Oh, maybe David mm. Galley from Rancho Santa Margarita. We'll mm. figure it out. We'll figure out David from orange. I'll look it up. I'll, yeah. <laughs> but what, did you have any conversations with Addie during this time? Like, hey, uh, you're doing awesome, and like supporting one another, or you said that she's very competitive. So was there that moment of like, hey, I, I'm gonna go, keep up, or any of that sort of uh, cheering on? Like, what was that moment like when you? off i mean we both talked about how tired we were Mm -hmm. and how much like this goat hill sucked we were like wow this sucks (laughs) Mm -hmm. and then we both we both mentioned to each other like yeah well we know we're both doing like sonoma and and i was like yeah like you've been racing a lot and it honestly was so supportive like you could have had a recorder on us and i would have been like super proud the way both in it both of us, like we just were having a normal conversation, almost like we were training partners, um, even though we're not. And when I decided to pass her, um, and make a move, I said, come on, Addie, come with me. Um, I was like, come on, let's, let's run this together. And then I kept on yelling at her for like a couple minutes. I was like, come on, Addie, stay with me. Cause I really did think, and I think, and you know, she was bonking right then. Um, which I realized after the fact, uh, like we would have, you know, duped it out to the, to the finish line had she not been bonking, um, which is so fun. It's like so cool to feel so fit and to have like another badass woman, like you said, you know, competitor who you're able to like push with. It's so cool. And man, had there been five more miles in that race, Anne-Marie Madden probably would have caught us both. So <laughs> She was clocking Shout pretty out. good too. Yeah. 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 She's such a strong finisher. So, um, and I, you know, I was like envisioning everyone else coming up behind us the whole time, Brittany Patterson and, or Peterson. Yeah. So, um, it was good and extremely supportive, but also like still really competitive, which is like why this race is so fun. I, we talked a bit about it earlier in the show and I'm just like, I'm just blown away by this, but looking at the finish times, I thought it was kind of a joke because I kept seeing photos of, you know, there's photos out there. <laughs> if, you, if you follow the hashtag for way too cool on Twitter and stuff like that, or even on Instagram, you'll see the trail is the entire like fire road is just water, right? Like there's, there's sections <laughs> yeah. where it's six to 10 inches of deep water. Just the entire yeah. trail is soaked and mud and everything. Uh, it was dumping rain all day. And then you look at the finish times and go, did they shorten the course? Yeah. Like, did they make it a 15 mile race or something? Because both men and women, just absolutely crushed it. Claire Gallagher with a 353. Uh, Addie right behind her with a 354. Uh, mm-hmm. Literally just a little over a minute behind. So obviously that race to the finish was just amazing. And Anne-Marie Madden, as you mentioned, at four hours pretty much flat. Uh, I can only imagine what this race would have been like if it was a 50 miler. Are you excited for Lake yeah. Sonoma coming out of this? Racing some of these same names? Yes. It's a little <laughs> soon to think about <laughs> yeah. I for the record I'm not going to a run tonight <laughs> I'll be okay. eating food and drinking yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> but yeah um no I'm so excited like it's just I really love racing like and 
and racing in an amazing place and, you know, celebrating the trails of that region and that interesting, you know, challenges of that region. Going back to, you know, Lake Sonoma, which is essentially where it's in the region of campfire and, you know, the, the bigger bay bubble. And um, I want to be there and support the economic, um, you know, outdoor rec there right. um, to – you know, and hopefully, um, just to be a part of it. Yeah. I'm, I'm really excited and it'll be fast. And I hear it's honestly a little, it's different than TNF 50. I'm excited. I've heard a lot of things. So, <laughs> uh, Alex Varner puts it, I think the most uh, efficiently and succinctly, and that's that it's death by a thousand paper cuts because the hills are designed and set <laughs> the hills are designed by the way, cause it is a man-made lake. The hills are designed yeah. in such a way yeah. as to <laughs> cut you apart little by little by little. Kim has run it twice. I, yeah, I've run it the last okay. two years. I oh, yeah, love yeah. it. Kim loves I it. I love it. Okay. Yeah. Are you doing it again? Not this year. She but, already won. Yeah. She, she got her gold ticket. I just ticket. keep winning. <laughs> no. Uh, not this year, but I, I hopefully, I will hope to go next year, I think. Yeah. I love that race. Yeah. It, it's it's such, yeah. just such a gorgeous area. And uh, there is rumors in the chat room that it is going to be super muddy because of all the rain that's been going on. Like, mm -hmm. That mud does not dry out right away. Despite yeah. it being California. So uh, I'm curious yeah, to see how the conditions are. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Can I get any, like, do you have any idea about your big goal for this year? Now that you have way too cool under the belt, you crushed it, you got Lake Sonoma ahead. Is there something this year that you were like, have you have your sights set on? Um, well, yes. I, I don't know if maybe I didn't mention it, but so I got an Ultra Trail World Tour ticket into Western States. So I, I'm, I'm doing awesome. States. Um, so yeah, I don't have to get top two at, at Sonoma. <laughs> um, and so that's my really big, you know, triple A goal. Cool. And, yay! and uh, <laughs> but mainly it's honestly mainly a redemption run because I DNF'd there two years ago at mile 93, <laughs> which I'm pretty sure I would, I ran in the opposite direction in way too cool and was like, Holy shit. Like this is where it all broke down. But it was like 3am at the time, right. <laughs> you know, two years. Mm -hmm. States. So, so I'm just excited to hopefully finish Western States. And, um, I have no race plans after that. Um, I kind of, I'm a little bit auspicious about, I don't want to plan too much in advance. Um, it just doesn't feel natural. I want to feel connected to, you know, California and that space and just like not overdo it. I'm trying to not overdo it. <laughs> um, and then honestly spend a lot of time in the American West. So Cal Colorado, um, mainly this summer. So we'll see what that looks like, but, um, you know, exploring places like where there are proposed mines and, you know, where extraction is going to happen. I feel really strongly about seeing lands as they are today before, um, you know, they get super torn up, uh, and, and documenting it and sharing it with people. Um, so that's what I'm really excited about. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think that's going to be a pretty amazing next couple of months just to follow along with yeah. and, and be able to put our optics on you and follow mm -hmm. at Lake Sonoma, see what happens at States. Uh, Claire, it is a pleasure to have you on the show. We need to get you back on sooner than later. It's been too long. So y your presence mm -hmm. is just joy and great and inspiring. So thank you for taking the time out tonight. Oh, thank you. Right back at you guys. Uh, you guys keep the community glued. Got to keep, gotta keep <laughs> it glued, yo. Dave, you guys are glued. Orange County. Yeah. Shout out to you, my yeah. friend. Um, uh, yeah. Claire, can you remind people where they can yeah. find you on social media? There's going to be questions that there, people are going to want to follow up on, and they're going to want to follow you in, in, in the next couple of months. So where can they find you? Cool. Sure. I'm on, I'm on all the socials, more or less. My name's Claire. <laughs> 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 C-L-I-R-E yeah. you can find me on Instagram at or Gallagher runs um, I'm on Twitter with my OG Twitter name from college when I didn't my, I, my girlfriends were like yeah you gotta get a Twitter name and I did it out of spite I was like I'm gonna make the longest Twitter name possible I hate yay. this <laughs> yeah puppies on mountains yay and uh, the highlight of my life was when Colorado's new attorney general, who I helped campaign for this fall, <laughs> tweeted me. And I was like, yes, he had to type out puppies on the <laughs> 
you know you know he's just sitting there like I'm just not going to ask. It's cool. Like I, she, I've met yeah. her. She's good. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, Claire, uh, yeah. keep doing what you're doing. Please don't ever stop with, with, uh, with, with your voice and, and doing what you do for, for all of us, because we all benefit from people like you who do so much, uh, behind the scenes. So, uh, continue doing what you're doing. Just keep crushing the trails and having fun of the process. Cause your fun is contagious and we continue to have fun because of it. So, Claire, it is Thanks a joy to so have you on much. the show, of course. Thanks so much. And I encourage people, if they have something they want to talk about that they're concerned about, trail-wise, public lands-wise, climate-wise, don't hesitate to reach out to me to tell your friends. You know, that's the biggest thing is, like, talking about these issues. Um, and I'm, I'm very serious. Like, don't hesitate. Just message me. And um, and I love to hear what people have to say. And and see what we can do about, you know, spreading more messages. Hell yeah. Hell yeah. <laughs> Thank you everyone for tuning in to uh, Ginger Runner Live episode number 249 tonight. It has been a joy. Uh, as always, we started a little bit earlier. Just go back and, and rewatch that front half. Uh, if you would like to support this show, Ginger Runner, uh, and everything that we do here, patreon.com slash the Ginger Runner for as little as a dollar a month. You get access to pretty much everything on the behind the scenes end of things. Tonight, we're going to be doing an after show as we do every single Monday. It'll just be Kim and myself. Claire actually has to bounce to go uh, drink and, and and hang out with her runners because she's just back to town. She's got to share the <laughs> celebration. Like, who would not want to be there right, right. now? Uh, but we'll be doing an after show talking a little bit about the Orcas camp. Uh, so join us there on Patreon, patreon.com slash the ginger runner. That's pretty much it. We like to end our shows now with uh, a new segment that we're calling Crew Member of the Week. Basically, what we want to do is highlight members of this community who are doing incredible things uh, this week in no part, uh, no particular order, <laughs> is a number of GR crew members, people who watch the show, support the show, and, and, and the like. At Orcas Trail Camp, we had a record number of viewers show up to a tiny island off the, course, off the coast of Washington to run some trails and like heard about it through the show or through the videos traveled out from across the u.s and beyond mm -hmm. uh and got all the transportation that it would take to get out to the small island so like ingen john uh love it uh there's a whole crew of supporters like, let me see if i can list everybody off i don't uh, think i can right now by but... memory no but there's a great photo uh over at the patreon facebook yes, page where everyone's tagged and it's it's amazing there's like 15 people or something that we got to meet and run with this weekend so they are all members of the gr crew member of the week uh this week which is pretty cool I think that's it. Yes. And if we you let Claire go, let eat Claire go to eat, drink and, and be <laughs> merry. If you have not already consider registering for Tiger Claw, which is our brand new race, 22 miles, 8,200 feet of gain and a choose your own adventure element that is pretty unique. Go to run tigerclaw.com. There are 10 spots left. That's so crazy. 10 or 11. I think it's 10 now. Uh, but please go to run tigerclaw.com. We would love to have you come out and get your ass kicked on May 4th. That is it, everyone. Get out there, train hard, race harder, and part of the <laughs> hardest. We'll see you next week. Bye bye. Bye. Ginger Runner.